Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome back to True Crime and Wine. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me. If you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you for joining me every single upload. You already know I love and I appreciate you so freaking much. Today we are, we're just jumping right on into it. We're gonna talk about a case that came to my attention a couple weeks ago from your TikTok submissions, the TikToks, or I guess they're not submissions, the TikToks that you tag me in and I've been reacting to, really loving that um, content. I'm loving that you are loving it. So thank you so much for doing that for me and allowing me to see some things that I, I haven't been seeing on TikTok because I'm trying my best to not get in the TikTok worm because once I get in, worm, wormhole. <laughs> Because once I get in, it's rabbit hole, isn't it? What am I doing? You know, I really was hopeful that 2023 would just like <laughs> help me more. But so far, we're the same. Hey, it is what it is. Anyways, the TikTok rabbit hole, it's, it's real. And I try my best to not get into it. Because I, I I'm like, oh, I'll just go on for 10 minutes. And then like 10 hours later, my eyes are like crossed. So... Yeah, anyways, thank you guys for doing that. Regardless, this case came from being tagged on there. I was so thankful for it. I was appalled that I did not hear about it since it happened or is happening in Canada, but I'm not surprised and I will tell you why, but before we get into it, I have a quick message for you. Before we get started, I wanna give a huge thank you to one of my favorite sponsors, June's Journey. I freaking love June's Journey. It is so on brand. I feel like not, not just for me and the channel, but for all of you who are watching, if you've never played it before, it is a hidden mystery objects game, but it's a story as you play. So you're going back into like the glamour years of the 1920s. You're constantly meeting new characters as you're unlocking levels, which keeps it really interesting. And then each scene that you complete, you go further into solving this like three thrilling mystery as June, who's trying to solve the murder of her sister and along the way she's unlocking like all of these family secrets. Best part about it is it's available for free. You can download it on your mobile devices, whether that is your phone or tablet. It's also available on Android and iOS and you can also play it on your desktop through Facebook. I think one of the things that I love most about it is it's a way for me to still have a way to unwind and relax. I really like getting on the app and just tuning everything out and getting caught up in the game and the mystery and the fact that it's a game and it makes that more lighthearted as opposed to all of the heavy content that we're always consuming. So it's a good way to still explore that mystery aspect of things without it being too heavy. If you wanna hop on board and start solving this mystery for yourself, you can download June's Journey. Like I said, it's free. All you have to do is just click the link in my description below. And the devices to do so on are endless. You can do it on your PC through Facebook. You can do it on your mobile phone, your tablet, and through Android or iOS. Thank you again so much, June's Journey, for sponsoring today's video. And thank you for allowing me to have this safe, comforting, relaxing place to go to and unwind after a long day of usually taxing research. All right, like I said, I was tagged in this case on TikTok. I hadn't heard about it before and I was just ill that I hadn't because I'm from Canada. But like I said, I wasn't surprised and that it sucks. It sucks that I wasn't surprised. And I'm also not going to be surprised that my views may potentially be substantially lower. To everyone that is here sharing it, helping me reach more exposure and eyes that aren't potentially on my channel right now, thank you. From the bottom of my freaking heart, thank you. I already know right now I'm going to need all the help I can get. So the shares, the likes, the comments, the, the subscribing, everything to boost the algorithm so that this can gain the attention that it needs to, it, it means more to me than ever. Today we are talking about the serial killer in Winnipeg who is coming to light and his alleged four victims and the sickening, twisted, disgusting way he lured these women to their death. I'm gonna go all the way back to the start because I know, like I said, I, I'm, I didn't know anything about this and I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in that sentiment. It wasn't until the families and social media just doing the dang thing, bringing the attention to this, 
that I heard about it, but this actually started all the way back in May. So it wasn't even December when this came on my radar and it was getting more traction um, across like social media and the minimal coverage that it, hit, it has received on the news and media. But this happened in May and what the outrage was, was when investigators <laughs> publicly said they believed they knew where the remains of some of the victims who had not been brought home were, and they had no plans to go and search for them and bring them home to their loved ones in the landfill that they believe they're in. There, there's so much to this though. So like I said, let's just go, let's go from the start. I guess the start in terms of anything that was like publicly put on record. May 18th, Winnipeg Homicide Unit arrested a 35-year-old man named Jeremy Skibicki. At this initial arrest, he was charged with the first-degree murder of a 24-year-old girl named Rebecca Contois. Now, initially, a search had been conducted two days prior in the garbage of a apartment building. Police were called at about 5.30 a.m. for a suspicious activity. My understanding is that somebody found partial remains of somebody in this garbage can, notified the police, they came to the scene, they searched the bins and, and discovered Rebecca Contois' dismembered body, but only partial remains, not all of her. And that in itself is just absolutely gut-wrenching. Rebecca was just a baby. She was just 24 years old. She had her whole life ahead of her. She was a young mama, had a little girl. And her family has primarily made statements through a support spokesperson. They are just devastated. They can't speak publicly. They're just absolutely broken. And one thing, you know, if you've if you've been here for a while, you know, I like to do is I try to get to know the victims that we speak about as much as I can. And one place that I like to go to is it's social media. And going back on Rebecca's Facebook um, from 2013, she was just so adorable and fully relatable for like that hype of that era of just being like hardcore love of uh, Justin Bieber. She was a believer. And on her social media, you can see how much she just loved her little girl. And it's heartbreaking to see that and then to process that somebody's child and the mother of a child was just discarded like this. Now, Canada is tough in terms of uh, accessing records. It's not the same as in many areas of the United States and in different states where records become unsealed prior to trial. So at this time, um, I don't know how that initial tip came through. I don't know what was said to bring the police to the garbage bins and have it searched just by reading through reports. Um, my understanding is that it was, it was somebody else who had seen remains in the garbage bin which brought the police there. So I just wanted to put that out there that um, at this time, like I don't have confirmation on that, but I do know that a call was placed, police arrived at about 5.30, and found Rebecca's partial remains. I also don't know how the next portion of this investigation played out. I'm assuming because it's in a garbage bin, it led police to the Brady landfill. And that's where in the following days, the rest of Rebecca's remains were discovered. Police have been very tight-lipped in their investigation, and we know that that happens for a number of reasons. First of all, like just speculation, they're working on their investigation, they can't give too much, and also to protect the integrity of the case. But when they did announce this arrest um, and they identified Rebecca, they did say that they had reason to believe that there were other victims, but didn't elaborate on it much. And that's where things kind of stayed. Uh, Jeremy had had and is still behind bars this entire time. But then on December 1st, 2022, just passed, the police officially made an announcement that yes, there were in fact more victims. There were three additional victims, so four in total. The other victims they identified as 39-year-old Morgan Harris, 26-year-old Mercedes Myron, and a fourth unidentified woman who indigenous leaders have named Buffalo woman. I just want to kind of go off course here for one second and just acknowledge how phenomenal Morgan Harris's daughters, Cambria and Kara, have been. 
these two girls are just warriors. They are heading the fight, not to just bring their mother home, but all of the women, they are speaking out wherever, whenever they can. And a huge focus for them right now is, it's identifying Buffalo woman. It's really emotional watching these girls on television, going through social media and seeing this fight that they are in every single day, posting, posting, sharing everything that they can. To see their strength is just, it's inspiring. And I don't know how they do that. Not only did the girls lose their mother, but they lost their father who they love very much as well seven years ago to cancer. And that really just you know, punches you in the gut when you know, you know, that both of their parents are gone. They're in this fight to bring their mom home, the other victims home. But what makes the whole situation even more upsetting is that this is a position they should not have even been in to begin with. The person who did this to these women should have never had the opportunity based on his history, his previous charges, he should have been behind bars already. And it's just so frustrating. It's like, how many times do I have to say this? I sound like a freaking broken record. I mean, I don't know what more you need in terms of red flags, in terms of first count experiences with this guy, pleading to authorities to keep him in jail. His history of violence against women is, it's sickening. He should have been behind bars for life, but we don't do that. We just let abusers, predators, multiple offenders of violent crimes continue to just walk out of jail with a slap on the wrist. So why is Jeremy no different, right? Let's go back to June 15th, 2015. Oh, I really wish that I wasn't partially participating in a dry January here because I really just need a little sip of something to get me through this and uh, lower the anger nerves. So on June 15th, 2015, Jeremy assaulted his common law partner and was arrested according to the report trigger warning just because we're going to read um, just a description of the abuse here. It says Skibiki grabbed his pregnant girlfriend's hair, punched her in the face several times, tried to strangle her, and told her he would kill her if she called the police. He was convicted. He spent two months in jail and then sentenced to two years probation. Just months after being released, December 21st, 2015, the same woman has to file a protection order against him saying that she feared that he would not stop unless he killed her because he said so. And we don't know why it's not clear in reports, but her request for this protection order was dismissed despite there being a stipulation in his probation that he was not to make contact with her for two years during that probationary period. Next record we have is from September 4th, 2018. At this time, Skibiki had married a, another woman. I just want to say right now, um, this is his estranged wife at this point. And she has said in a protection order that she was under the influence on their wedding day. And only four days prior, um, she had just gone to detox for meth addiction. And this is important because this is Jeremy's MO. He preys on vulnerable women who are at a point in their lives where they are going through some struggles. He seek and he seeks them out. And we'll get into how he does that later, which is just, it's disgusting. On their one year anniversary, so this would be September 4th, 2019, um, his wife was granted a protection order against him for three years. And in her application, she says like his previous victim, she had suffered a litany of abuse. There was not just one occasion that this happened on, this happened often, and that multiple times he also threatened to kill her. I mean, I just don't, oh, it's so frustrating. I just don't understand how many times someone has to be, you know, threatened to be killed before you take that threat and the victim pleading for protection seriously. All right, and this part just, oh my gosh, it's just like, ah! It enrages me. I don't know why, like, I, like, have to laugh and smile through it sometimes. That's how I react. I mean, if you've been here for a long time, you know that. Like, when I'm just, like, really fired up, that is just my my response in those really upsetting situations. So I'm not laughing in by any means. It's like, that's how mad I am. So in January, 2021, his estranged wife was attacked by Jeremy. In this incident, she was chased down 
an apartment hallway with a knife. She, like his previous common law partner, was repeatedly punched in the head and also abused with a cane. At the time, Jeremy was charged with assault with a weapon and assault causing bodily harm. But those charges ended up being stayed. December 14th, 2021, a judge acquitted Jeremy. The, this, this charge particular was for him violating the protection order that banned him from contacting her. So he acquits, he acquits him of this and his reasoning is, is that he found her testimony unreliable due to her memory loss. This woman is officially been diagnosed with post-concussion syndrome after an attack that had happened at the hands of Jeremy. Her memory is compromised because of him and her protection order and his violation of a protection order meant to protect her acquits him because her testimony was unreliable because he had beat her so badly that she can't remember everything like she's supposed to. Allegedly, those charges were reevaluated um, after a judge uh, made a statement that there was reliability found in her testimony. Unfortunately, it's like too little too late because this completely opened up the door for him not being arrested when he should have been, been in jail for violating that protection order, and gave him the opportunity to murder Rebecca Mercedes Morgan and Buffalo Woman. And it's kind of the delays that seem to be a pattern here also. I get that there is protocol to follow in terms of having all of your ducks lined up in a row so that you can acquire proper warrants and arrest warrants. But May 16th is the day that Rebecca's uh, remains were initially found, but Jeremy wasn't arrested until two days later on May 18th. So my understanding is that the garbage bin that Rebecca was found in was not directly behind, like in his complex, but right near it, making it, you know, pretty easy for him to see if there was police activity around there, searching there, tipping him off that they're looking for something in there. And it's around this time in between those days, so maybe later on in, on the 16th or 17th, that Morgan and Mercedes were transported to the landfill. The timeline that police have is that right in the first couple weeks of May is when Rebecca, Mercedes, and Morgan were killed. Morgan was last seen on May 1st, so it's believed that this was around the time that she was murdered. And a few days later on May 4th is when they believe that Mercedes was lured and then killed as well. The theory is that 10, 11 days later is when Rebecca was killed and then found on the 16th, but the police really need the public's assistance in identifying the fourth victim who actually they believe is the first victim, Buffalo Woman. Like I said, we don't know how they've gotten to this conclusion, but it is believed that around March 15th, 2022 is when his first victim was killed. Police have released this photo of a baby fat jacket that they believe belonged to the woman if anybody has any information, please contact the resources that I have linked in my description below. Um, police have previously said that they believe this woman to be indigenous in her 20s, but like I said, we, we don't have any information about um, how they have determined that. Now, like I said at the beginning of the video, one of the most despicable pieces of this case is how Jeremy chose his victims. These women are believed to have actually known Jeremy, not just chosen at random in an instant impulsively. They are believed to have trusted him and that's because he sought out women who were vulnerable and easy to deceive. Now something in common between all of these women is that they were known to frequent and I apologize, I've looked for ways to pronounce the name of this shelter. I really don't want to butcher it, and I, I know that I probably will, so apologies in advance. These women were known to frequent the Nadina Wemak shelter, as well as others in the area for meals and a warm place to stay at night. Now, despite Jeremy having a home, and money coming in from government assistance, he would visit these 
facilities frequently, almost daily, and prey on women who were, again, at a point in their life where they just were not the strongest. It's believed that he gained their trust and most likely manipulated them into thinking, hey, you know, come, come to my place. It's warm, got shelter, I can cook you up a meal, and perhaps even offered or enticed with drugs. And I just wanna remind anybody out there who comes across this video who might not be a regular on the channel and might not see things the way that the majority of my viewers and myself do just because somebody is in a tough point in their life because they are struggling with some sort of substance issue, mental health issue, does not make them any less of a human. They had family who loved them. They had friends who loved them. In fact, Mercedes was out looking for her friend, but she, nailed the problem on the head where she said, oftentimes they will go to people of authority and say, hey, my friend is missing. This person has, you know, been given off weird vibes. We're actually, we haven't seen him lately either. So that's a little bit suspicious, but they get the same pushback and nobody goes and looks for them because the situation that they're dealing with in their life is not preferred. I mean, look at Robert Picton, how many women, even victims, prior to being victims, said his name, spoke about the issues that were happening on this man's farm, and nobody was taken seriously. And this pattern of him seeking out women in vulnerable situations is not new to him. His estranged wife that we spoke about earlier, you know, the one begging for help from him, naming him, charging him with abuse and attempted murder, and him saying that he was gonna kill her, having a protection order that he broke, but him still being released because she was unreliable because of the head injuries that he gave her. Yeah, her, yeah, he met her at a mission center in February, 2018. This is what he does. She kind of gives a little bit of insight about probably how he was able to lure his victims. She said that when they met, uh, they were both standing in a lineup outside of the mission center. It was cold. They were waiting to get in, warm up, get some food. He struck up a, a conversation. He was very um, cordial, very nice, charming. And he offered, you know, instead of waiting in this line and hoping that you get a bed in here, how about you come back with me? I've actually got a place to stay. And she she went to his apartment. That's, you know, when she learned not too long after this relationship of theirs started that he really wasn't this charming guy. He had very angry, abusive outbursts. He was very controlling. She wasn't allowed to have a phone. He took it away from her multiple times. She said she was smothered with a pillow and she didn't always stay silent. There were numerous times that she called police and asked for help. I just wanna share a little bit about where this woman is now in her life and just how it goes to show that when you do have the proper resources, when you're able to push through this tough time that you're going through in your life and get back and reconnect with your family and your loved ones, you can claw your way out of the situation that you're in and, and why we should not quickly pass judgment or assume or point fingers as to why somebody is in the struggle that they're going through. But this woman now is two years sober and currently in school so that she can properly help people who are also struggling with addiction and let them know that, hey, you can get out of this. You can make something of your life. Despite that though, she still deals with survivor's guilt, even though she did everything that she possibly could to bring attention to this man. And she suffers daily with the ramifications of the abuse that this man put her through. She has to wear glasses that are tinted because the the light hurts her eyes so much that affects the brain injury that she was given. She has a scar on her head. She has to constantly get Botox treatments for the crippling migraines that she suffers. And I mean, that in itself would make it so easy to understand why somebody would be heavily dependent on narcotics and drugs to mask that pain and the trauma that you have gone through. So it just puts into perspective that we really don't know somebody else's story. Now, investigators have said that they only believe that these four women were victims of 
Jeremy and that there aren't others out there. It has been stated by uh, people who lived in the building, a neighbor of his specifically who had interactions with Jeremy. He did see over a dozen women come and go through several month period of time. He said he was never able to have any interactions with these women. Jeremy made it very clear that he was protective where like you don't even look at them. My thoughts when I heard that was like, is it more of like a protection thing or of a an identification thing? Like, yes, I saw this woman in this apartment. But it just goes to show, you know, like the, how much he felt like he was protected and didn't try to conceal anything. He even told this neighbor that he would meet these women at shelters. And at the time he thought, oh, okay, like maybe he's just offering them like a, a warm place to stay and then not really registering like, okay, like, well, why is he going there? Like he doesn't need to be there. He has a house that so he doesn't need to stay at a shelter. And then looking back, he's like, oh yeah, that actually is quite predatory. Now the following portion of the case is what has left the victims' families, and I mean Canadians, <laughs> seething. And it's after all of this, after all of the missed opportunities to have him in jail years ago, the predatory acts of just being able to go into these facilities and plucking his victims. Everyone was re-victimized when they found out that there was no intention of searching the landfill and bringing the remains of these women home to their loved ones. There was a search done at the landfill, but remember, Rebecca's remains in the garbage were found on May 15th. And it wasn't until June 2nd that police began searching the Winnipeg Brady landfill to find the rest of Rebecca's remains. It was two weeks later on June 15th that the rest of the remains of Rebecca were discovered. And five days after that, on June 20th, silently homicide inve investigators had determined that they believed that Morgan and Mercedes were likely at the Prairie Green landfill, but they didn't di disclose this to the public until December. There was allegedly a, a load that they were, you know, an area that they were um, interested in looking, but by this point, 10 thousand loads of garbage had already been dumped. And that's when on December 6th, they make a public statement saying that they believed the women were in the landfill, but it wasn't feasible for them to search at that time. And this is when the victims, loved ones, Cambria, Kara, are calling and begging for police to go and bring their, their mom, their child, their grandchild, their sister home. And again, <laughs> During this time, in, and I mean, I don't want to be, you know, judgy, point finger, but I guess here we go. There, There's statements being made, officials being like, oh, we're going to see if there's anything that we can do, try to find ways of covering costs to find a new way to search the area. At the time, though, business is just running as usual. You think about all of, of the loads that are being dumped on, in the landfill, and I mean, while this is being said, there wasn't really a lot of action being done behind the scenes. And I ended up seeing on, I think it was Cambria's Facebook, that on December 17th, the community were making pleas and organizing these blockades to prevent any trucks from coming in and dumping more garbage. I came across this post on Facebook um, and it it put into perspective how how crucial that was to have things halted or a way of, you know, protecting the, the area that they believed they needed to further investigate at the very minimal. So it says, from the discovery of Rebecca Contois' remains at a dumpster in Winnipeg on May 16th to police shutting down a portion of Brady Landfill, three to five hours had elapsed. In that three to five hour time span, 100 trucks had been dumped there. It had taken a month for them to find her remains. And I'm sorry, I'm just realizing now that I, I, I verbally said Brady Landfill and then Prairie Green Landfill. So Prairie Green Landfill is where they believe Mercedes, Morgan, and Buffalo women woman were disposed of. So from that time, 34 days had passed between when they think that those three women were dumped in the landfill. In that time, nine thousand tons of heavy construction mud, 250 tons of asbestos, 
and 1,500 tons of animal remains were dumped there. This landfill runs heavy machinery consistently to compact the waste that comes in. It just, like, this part just, it makes your heart sink. It says, by investigators' best guess, that would probably put the remains of the three murder victims somewhere in a four-acre space under 40 feet of heavily compacted waste. And this statement, I mean, I guess, you know, people can have intentions, but it was our, from the forensic unit. Our intent, our intent from minute one was to conduct a search of the landfill, and this just wasn't feasible for the dis for the things I described today, putting into perspective all of that. And it's like, okay, but 34 days had passed. And now the announcement is being made all the way in December, where it's like, oh yeah, we can't do that. Well, can you imagine what that looks, that scene looks like now to them, those numbers, those tons look like today. Another piece of, of all of this, like, uh, well, we can say things, but actions speak louder than words. And why it's so important to not just rely on, on the information that you're reading in an article or seeing on the news and actually going to these individuals, you know, social medias where things are being updated, these family members, and see what is actually happening real time, day to day, behind the scenes. Because the premier of Manitoba, Heather Stephenson, had gone on TV with Indigenous leaders and said she is going to halt all dumping, and they are gonna do everything that they can to bring these women home. Later, just made a statement in the paper, did not go publicly like she did before, on a stand, having like all the cameras and everything, but then there was a little write-up, just for clarification, that it's only a section that they're gonna halt at this point. One of the arguments, or not arguments, I guess, um, one of the defending reasons behind this not being feasible is the cost. And I just wanted to quickly touch on this. So for context, they proposed that the search was gonna cost $150,000 and that proposal was rejected, which is, this proposal was less than 0.05% of the annual $320 million budget. But do you know what did get approved? A $257,000 robot dog. Unless this robot dog has the abilities and capabilities to go to this landfill and dig up the remains of these women, F your robot dog. I, I just don't even have the words. It makes you sick. We're gonna wrap this up with the obvious clear, clear message here that they're there needs to be change. It can't just be getting on your podium, making a statement, saying all of the right things, and then there just not being any follow through. And I think I understand why, frankly, members of the Indigenous community, leaders of the Indigenous community are just sick of it. I thought about it as like, you know, like where you've got like, maybe you're in a relationship like this now, maybe you've been in a relationship like, like this in the past. I know that I have been where it's like someone just keeps just sputtering bullshit, talking you in circles. And at first it works a little bit. And then eventually you just get tired of hearing their voice and it literally just list like sounds in your head, like jibber jab, like, like somebody just blah, 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 word vomiting like this all over to you. And you just look at them and you're like, stop talking, stop talking, do your actions. Do you know what I mean? Like I can only imagine what it's like for them to listen to this day in and day out and nothing really happen. I will be following this closely and I will we'll be updating you um, with, you know, big announcements as they hopefully come. Um, but like I said, I strongly, strongly encourage you to go and follow all of the people who are actually in this day in and day out and updating this from firsthand experience. I'm going to have Morgan's daughter Cambria's Facebook linked in my description. She updates a lot on Facebook. Like I said, I just, I think the world of her, I don't even know her. I wish I could just go and give her the biggest hug. If Cambria, if you ever come across this video, if you need anything from me, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email is sherilyndale at gmail.com. Just for anybody knowing that is mostly, you know, business email. So a lot of people read that email and I don't get it to it as often. Um, 
as I'd like to, but when something like this uh, comes through, it gets pushed to me really quickly. And I think with that, I just wanna leave off with a post um, that she just recently wrote to her mama on Christmas. And I think it helps connect you to these women and see how loved they were and how we need to be just as enraged as if this was our loved one. So her post to her mama at Christmas said, I had a voice within myself an hour ago saying to go hang your photos. So I did, and I'm so glad I did. These photos of you show what a life you lived and how much you loved and cherished your kids, as well as how bright of a woman you were and loving soul. I wish the world could have seen that and cherished you for the woman you were. I love and miss you so much. I pray you find your way to where you need to, and I pray we can find you. I put red ribbons on my tree for you and hung your photos so we can show how full of life you were. Anywho, Merry Christmas where you are, and I hope you're at peace. Whew. Please go send her some, some Sippendale love, you guys. All right, that is it for me today. Oh, I'm having a tough one getting through this. Oh my God. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.